Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering, IIT Guwahati. And what we were discussing, we were discussing about the different properties of the enzyme in the course Enzyme Sense and Technology. And so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the uh, chromatographic method, we have discussed about the spectroscopic method, and we have also discussed about the electrophoretic method in the previous module. And when the enzyme and substrates are interacting with each other, there are several parameters which need to be fulfilled, right? One of the critical parameter is the geometric constraints or geometry complementarity. So, the three-dimensional structure of a substrate should match with the three-dimensional cavity what is present within the enzyme structures. Apart from that, it also should be able to, you know, make the robust interactions with the residues present within the protein structure. And then at the end, the enzyme is always been recognizing or making a preferring a particular stereospecificity of a ligand versus other stereospecificity. So, in this context, uh, we have uh, discussed about the different types of techniques what you can actually be able to use. And what we have discussed so far, when the enzyme is interacting with the substrate, it is making the enzyme substrate complex. And in in this process, it is it is actually inducing the different types of conformations or different types of modulations into the enzyme structures. And all these modulations can be studied with the different types of techniques. For example, if it is modulating the size, it can be studied with the help of the electrophoresis and as well as the gelification chromatography. Whereas, if it is inducing a uh, additional charge or it is masking or giving the hydrophobic uh, nature to the enzyme that can be mapped into the ion exchange chromatography or the hydrophobic interaction chromatography. So, apart from these modifications, when the enzyme interacts with the substrates, it also, uh, you know, results into the uh, either the generation of heat or the absorption of heat. You, you know that the, en the enzyme is actually interacting with the substrate and after it is forming the enzyme substrate complex, from the enzyme substrate complex, it is actually converting into the product. And when the substrates bind into the enzyme cavity, it is making few bonds and it is actually, dis you know, uh, breaking some bonds. And you know that the formation of bond or the breaking of bond is always been associated with the energy or or the exchange of energy right so this exchange of energy can be studied in a technique which is called as the isothermal titration calorimetry and which actually going to allow you to study when you are adding a enzyme or when you are adding a substrate into the enzyme whether there will be a generation of heat or where there will be a absorption of heat so, let us start discussing about the isothermal titration calorimetry. So, isothermal titration calorimetry as the name suggests, it is actually a technique which is going to in which is going to measure the heat uh, whether it is being uh, absorbed by the system or it is actually going to be released from the system. Okay. So, the isothermal titration calorimetry is a technique used in the quantitatively in a measure of a wide variety of biomolecular interactions. A direct measurement of heat either generated or absorbed when the molecule interacts, right? And uh, directly measure the heat that is either been released or absorbed during a biomolecular binding reactions. And that is how this uh, amount of heat what is going to be released or absorbed can be correlated to the binding studies. So, uh, all uh, binding pairs, so when, when the, you can actually be able to measure the heat simultaneously, you can also be able to measure the other binding parameters such as you can be able to calculate the binding constant or KD, you can actually be able to calculate the reaction stoichiometry, you can be able to calculate the enthalpy and the entropy of that particular reaction. Uh, since this is a label free uh, technique, there is no need of modification of bonding pattern, uh, binding pattern either with close intact or labeling or through the immobilization. This means this is a label free technique, okay. And uh, this is a major, one of the major advantage why you have to use the ITC 
uh, for uh, measuring the interaction between the two biomolecules. Uh, it goes beyond the biofinity and can elucidate even the mechanism underlying the molecular interactions. Uh, apart from that, the isothermal titration colorimetry is used to measure the interaction between the biomolecules. It determines the binding affinity, stoichiometry, enthalpy, entropy and the binding reaction in solution without any labeling. When the binding occurs, heat is either absorbed or released and this is measured by a sensitive calorimeter during the gradual titration of the ligand into the sample cell containing the biomolecule of the interest. So, what you require is you require a reaction vessels where you are actually going to perform the reactions and in this process in that particular vessel you are actually going to measure the amount of heat what is going to be absorbed or what is going to be released. So, what you require is you require a reaction vessel where you are going to have a reference cell. This reference cell is actually going to be used to uh, you know to uh, to know whether the heat is being released or heat is being absorbed. And then you are going to have the sample cell where you are actually going to keep the enzyme in the sample cell. And then with the help of a syringe, you are actually going to add the ligand and that is how the uh, you can set up the reactions and that is how it, the ligand is actually going to be added to this enzyme in a regular fashion. And what will happen at the end is that when the ligand is going to be injected, it will either going to absorb the uh, energy or it is actually going to release the energy, right, because of the intramolecular interaction with the enzyme molecules. And uh, the reference cell is actually going to tell you whether this particular cell is a, on a higher heat or it is on a lower heat. And that is how you can be able to measure whether there will be a heat absorption or the release of heat. And then you can actually be able to have a curve, right? So you can be able to plot the delta H versus the molar ratio and that is how these curves analysis of this particular curve can be allow you to um, uh, measure the stoichiometry. Now uh, let us see the description of this particular instrumentation part, right? So, uh, in the instrumentation of the ITC, what you have is you have a thermal core uh, and you also have a measurement, you have to make a measurement mechanisms. So, in the thermal core, in the thermal core, you have a micro calorimeter, there are two cells, one of which is containing water and act as a reference cell, the other contains the sample. The micro calorimeter need to be keep these two cells at exactly the same temperature. This means basically what is happening is that you are actually going to have a reference cell and this reference cell is actually going to have some amount of water, right? Uh, or you can say buffer, right? And here what you have is you have the water plus enzyme. So as soon as you are actually going to make any kind of addition into this water, the temperature of this particular cell is actually going to either go up or it will actually going to go down. If it goes up, the heat is, the temperature difference is going to be present between this cell and this cell. So for example, imagine that the both of these cells are at 37 degrees Celsius. So this one is also at 37 degrees Celsius. Okay. Now, imagine that there will be a release of some heat. So, when there will be a release of some heat, the temperature is also will go up. So, for example, if the temperature is gone up to 38 degree, although in the ITC reaction, you would, will not see a change in 1 degree or 5 degree or something, right? It is actually going to be very, very small. But just for a, 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 just to explain you the mechanism, how the I, ITC is actually measuring the uh, heat evolved or something, right? Then what will happen is that, so it is become 38, this become 37, right? So reference is 37. So what will happen is that you are actually going to spend some energy, right? So you are actually going to withdraw some amount of heat from this particular cell so that both of them, so that it will return back to the 37, right? This amount of heat, what you are actually going to use or what is going to be utilized to bring the 38 to 37 that is going to be given here, right? And that is how this heat can be plotted against 
the each injection. So in each injection, you can have one injection, you can have, you can lower, you can inject five microliter of sample. In the second injection, you can have another five microliter of your ligand and so on. So it, each injection, the amount of temperature in raise in temperature is going to be keep reducing because it, this raise is happening because the enzyme is interacting with the substrate, right? So in, in, if the enzyme is interacting with the substrate, it is actually making a lot of rearrangement of within the enzyme and because of this rearrangement, a lot of interactions are getting broken or you are actually forming the new uh, interactions and because of that, there will be uh, either a release of heat or there will be uh, absorption of heat. Either of these cases, you are actually going to see a pattern like this. Uh, and then this pattern can be analyzed uh, uh, in a subsequent uh, steps and that's how you can be able to calculate the stoichiometry, you can be able to calculate the enthalpy, entropy and all those kind of thermodynamic uh, parameters. So uh, the heat sensing device detect the temperature difference between the two cell, between the cell when binding occur and give the feedback to the heater which compensate for this difference and return the cell to the equal temperature. And this is what I have explained already that reference cell is only being used to say whether there will be a heat released or whether there will be a heat absorption. If there will be a heat absorption, the temperature will come down from 37 to 35. And then there will be he there will be a heater which is going to turn on and that's how it is actually going to bring the reaction or bring the temperature back to 37. So that is the way you are actually going to know what is the amount of heat what is going to be released. Now, the, uh, how you are going to make the measurements? The reference cell and the sample cell are set to be at a desired temperature. So you can actually be able to set, you can set 37 degrees Celsius, you can set it as uh, room temperature like 25 degrees Celsius and so on. The ligand is loaded into the serine which sits in a very accurate injection device. The injection device is inserted into the sample cell containing the enzyme of interest. A series of small amount of ligands are injected into the protein solution. If there is a binding of the ligand to the protein, heat exchange of the few milli uh, degree Celsius are detected and measured. Okay. So this is that exactly going to happen. So this is your reference cell, you are going to have a sample cell and uh, with the help of the syringe, you can be able to inject a sample like in the 5 microliter, 1 microliter, whatever the increment you want, right? And you can make the many types of modification and this is what you are going to have. You are going to have a raw data and that raw data is actually going to be look like this, right? Where it will say that how much the heat is being involved, right? So this raw data could be of this way. So you will see this is actually getting saturated because the, the binding site, for example, you have 10 molecules of enzyme, right? So what will happen is when you do the first reaction, uh, the first molecule is going to be, you know, uh, completely occupied by the substrate and it is actually going to make the substrate complex, right? And you are actually going to have one molecule of enzyme substrate complex. But the nine enzyme molecules are still left, right? So then when you add some more amount of substrate, that also is going to bind and that's how it is actually going to form the nine molecules of enzyme substrate complex, which means together they are actually going to be get all the enzyme molecules are now going to have the substrate molecule and that's how this heat is actually going to be on a lower and lower and lower, right? So heat what is being evolved or what is going to be absorbed, that phenomena is actually going to be on a lower side and that's how at this stage the system is actually going to be get saturated. So you have to use, you have to do this titration with the ligand molecule until you will not see a saturation. Once you this saturation, then you are saying that, okay, uh, everything is fine. And using this data, you can be able to calculate the affinity parameters, which means you can be able to calculate the KD values, you can be able to calculate the stoichiometry, which means how many enzyme molecules, uh, how many ligands are binding to the enzyme molecule, so enzyme or uh, ligand ratio. And then you also can say, what is the binding mechanism, whether the binding mechanism is 
exothermic, uh, whether it is the endothermic, right? All these parameters, all these informations you can actually be able to get. And whether uh, it is a sequential binding or it is actually a non-sequential binding. So these are the some of the components and I have taken an example, right? So you, if you can have the like natural products, like for example, you can have a natural product from mentha or you can have from tea and you want to know whether these phytochemicals are binding to some protein molecules or no. So this is the uh, isothermal titration colorimetry uh, instruments and ultimately you're going to get this particular type of curve. And that curve is actually going to give you the all the parameters like the KD values, affinity parameters, uh, stoichiometry, uh, change in enthalpy and change in entropy. And when you can actually be, uh, and using this uh, data for multiple round, you can be able to do the optimization to calculate the enzyme substrate interactions. So now let's see how you can be able to perform this experiment and what are the things you require actually. So for the experiment, what you require is you require a ligand, which is going to be present in the syringe. You require a biomolecule like the enzyme uh, in the syringe, in the, in the vessel, right? Then you require uh, interaction heat, which is going to be measured. And uh, these are the parameters what are going to be measured. You can actually be able to calculate the KD values. You can be able to calculate the enthalpy. So you can actually be able to calculate the delta H. And then you can also be able to calculate the number of binding sites and so on. So uh, this is the way you are going to do. So this is the reaction vessel where you have the enzyme, right? And this is your uh, ligands. So what you're going to do is you're going to do multiple injections. So when you do the first injection, as the first injection made all ligand bound to the target molecule, it is actually going to be result into the maximum change in heat, maximum change in heat, because all the substrate molecule will go and bind to the enzyme. And that's how it is actually going to make the maximum change in the heat. And that's why you will see that the, the depth of this particular peak is very high, right? In a two signal in return to the baseline before next injection. So when you do the next injection, right, what you will see is that this uh, height or this depth is actually going to be keep reducing because the number of substrate molecule which are going to be bind is not going to be 100%, right? And ultimately what you will see is that it is actually going to get saturated like this. So as the injection continues, the target becomes saturated with a compound. So less binding occurs and the heat change starts to decrease. So when the ligand is not binding, it is not making any kind of modifications. It's not going to make any kind of alterations. And as a result, it is there will be a lesser amount of heat exchange. And as a, as a result, at the end, what you are going to get, you are going to get this result. You are going to get a change in heat right for every injection so every injection you are going to see a change in the heat and that heat what you see is a pattern right and that is the ideal pattern that you are going to see a saturation so if you don't see a saturation that means there are something uh, problematic either you are you know having a background uh, reactions or you know, there's something you know artifacts going on and because of this you can be able to do a lot of calculation and you can be able to do the uh, determination of different types of thermodynamic parameters. So from this data, this is the raw data. You can be able to plot the uh, derived data. You can actually be able to calculate the kilocalorie per mole, a change in heat energy and um, uh, across the molar ratio. And that's how you can be able to calculate the delta H. You can be able to calculate the binding constant. You can be able to calculate the stoichiometry. Uh, how you can be able to do the thermodynamics uh, parameters? So you can actually be able to use the following reactions, like right? so this is the Gibbs reactions and you can be able to use the Gibbs energy and the relationship between the delta. So delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S or it is actually equivalent to the RT lin KB. And using this, you can be able to calculate the KB and you can be able to calculate the delta G, delta H, delta S. Uh, and uh, so you can be able to calculate the Gibbs free energy, enthalpy, entropy, and so on. And uh, so putting these values, you can be able to do a lot of calculations and that's how you can be able to do, uh, you know, all these measurements. Uh, 
So uh, to explain this, all these processes and how you can be able to perform the react, how you can be able to perform the experiments and how you can be able to get the raw data, how you can be able to process the raw data so that you can be able to calculate the all these affinity parameters. We have prepared a small demo clip where the students are actually explaining. So first they are actually going to show you a description about the, uh, the instrument and then they are actually going to show you what are the different requirements, different types of things what you require and how to perform the experiment. And once post uh, experiments, they are going to get the raw data and then they are actually going to show you how you can be able to analyze the data to calculate the affinity parameters. Hello everyone, I am Alok Kumar Pandey, a PhD scholar under Professor Vishal Trivedi in the Department of Bioscience and Bioengineering, IIT Guwahati. Today in this video, I will I am presenting a demo on isothermal calorimetry instrument, that is ITC instrument. So ITC is generally used to study the interactions between two molecules or between two biomolecules. For example, we can study interactions between a protein and a ligand, between two proteins also and many other. So first we will start with the what are the parts of this instrument. So the instrument looks like this. There are two compartments, this is the cleaning compartment and this is the titration compartment or experimental compartment. So we will come to the cleaning compartment first. So the cleaning compartment, it contains these four bottles. This one, the white cap bottle is the bottle containing the detergent which is used for cleaning the various parts like the cell and the syringe of syringe and this is the uh, red cap bottle which contains methanol which is used for drying after cleaning. This is a uh, blue cap bottle which contains water, filtered and autoclave water uh, which is used also used for cleaning. Uh, the methanol here should be a HPLC grade not normal methanol and this the fourth bigger bottle it is for waste. So all the waste after cleaning goes into this discard bottle. So now we will come to the second compartment which is the uh, experimental compartment or titration compartment. So this is the, this is called as the cell. In, in the cell, we generally put the uh, whatever I, I, uh, entity with which is having lower concentration. For example, in protein ligand, we generally put protein into the cells. We, you can see inside a hole is there, that is the sample cell. And besides this cell, one more cell which is not visible is there, that is called as the reference cell. That is uh, constantly filled with 280 microliter of water and it needs not to be changed every time but uh, around once in two weeks or in a month. Now this is the uh, syringe in which we generally load the entity of higher concentration or in a protein ligand interaction we can say we put ligand into this syringe. This is the filled port adapter which is required to uh, during cleaning or during loading of the uh, ligand into the syringe and this is called as the cell cleaning tool which is used to clean used during the cleaning of the cell so so now i will explain i will start with how to clean this instrument so for cleaning this instrument first what we need to do is first we need to put this uh, put this cell cleaning tool into the cell and ensure that it is nicely fitted into this there should not be any leakage and then for the syringe first we need to put this uh, fill port adapter into the socket provided here we have to see it and then we have to put it into this firmly it should be firm and after that we should move this uh, syringe into the here it is written clean into the clean location we will move it slowly and we will ensure that this clamp is nicely engaged here so after doing this now we need to use the control software to set the wash parameter the way we want to wash for, and, and the method of washing generally we have to set through the software so we will go to the software now so now we will open up the control software for itc this is the control software, this is the first window, now we will click on open uh, which will open up window with three options, load, run and clean. So we are going to clean, so we will click on clean. 
After clicking on clean, it will show a video which will de depict all the steps which we just performed in the demo. So uh, after doing each step, we have just have to click uh, next. We have to ensure that the step is done and we have to click next. So I will click next. Here, here it is giving uh, the which uh, method you want to clean the cell and the syringe. In this, three options are there. Uh, rinse in which it will only rinse with water. Uh, with in wash it will wash the cell with detergent and then rinse with water. In soak it will soak the cell in detergent for 30 minutes at 60 degrees centigrade and then rinse with water. And in the syringe cleaning method similarly rinse, wash and none option is there. So we have already uh, I have selected this wash option uh, for uh, cell cleaning and the wash option for syringe cleaning. I will click next. Next again it is showing the uh, steps which I, I have already discussed in the demo it, uh, to put the pipette in the sample cell, how to put the pipette into the sample cell. So this step is already done. Now the how to put the fill port adapter and into the syringe that is step is also done. Now you have to move the pipette to the clean location, this step is also done, so we will click next. Now the cleaning is start and it is showing here starting vacuum. First it will uh, create vacuum into the instrument and if there is any leakage it may show an error. So we have to, while putting up all the cell cleaning tool and syringe fill port adapter, we have to ensure that there should not be any leakage, everything should be tightly and firmly seated. So the cleaning has started, we can see uh, now it is testing the vacuum and now after testing the vacuum it will start uh, cleaning the cell, see emptying cell. So now the cleaning will run for, uh, it is showing time remaining 11 minutes, around 11 minutes uh, 20 seconds. So now it will go for that much time and the cleaning will be done. So now we are done with the cleaning, then we will go to the loading of the sample of the protein and the ligand. So before loading, I would like to tell two points which are very important in sample preparation. First one is that the concentration of both the protein and the ligand should be very accurately measured. And the second point is that the buffer in which the protein is uh, dissolved and the ligand is dissolved should be exactly same or closest uh, similar possible. So because buffer mismatch may interfere with your results. So now we will come to loading. So after cleaning we need to remove this cell cleaning tool from the cell and after that using this loading syringe we need to first take out or clean out whatever is left inside the cell after cleaning. So we will discard these things. So now we have removed the, everything from the cell. Now we will wash this syringe first first with water and then three times first we will wash it with water and then after washing with water we will wash this with the buffer in which our protein is dissolved so that the environment of the protein does not change as much and there is no buffer mismatch. So now the syringe is washed with buffer. Now we can take our protein into this syringe. So we will take exactly 300 microliter of this into the syringe and we will take it very slowly so that no air bubble enters the syringe. Exactly three micro, 300 microliter we will take. Okay. So it is 300 microliter. Now we will load this into the cell. So while loading, we have to ensure that no air bubbles is formed, what we will do first, we have to push the plunger very slowly for around 180, sorry 150 microliter and after that, after that 150 microliter, we have to move it little fast so that no, so that if bubble is there, it will come up and the last part, again we have to move it very slowly so that no air bubble enters. Okay. And now after that we can move the syringe like this to 
we remove any air bubble if any air bubble is there it will come up and then we can remove it using the syringe manually so now we will see the our protein sample is in the cell so now if any thing is extra we will can remove it using this syringe so that the protein is exactly filled into the cell i will put the protein back now now we'll come we'll put this syringe into its storage storage our cell is loaded now we will load the syringe with the ligand solution so we will disengage this clamp and we can see the fill port adapter is already attached to it so we need not to worry about that and now we will take in a 200 microliter mct tube we will take around 100 microliter of 100 microliter of our ligand this is the ligand it is dissolved in the same buffer as the protein now we will take 100 microliter of this ligand into this 200 microliter mct or pcr tube so now we will put this pcr tube into this position where it is written as load and now we can we will move this syringe into this tube so that it go till the bottom now now again for loading of this syringe we have to go to the control software of our itc instrument so when we give command from the from the software this will start loading the uh, ligand into the syringe so it will be in three step in the first step it will open up the fill port and after that it will is remove whatever the is the dead volume and after that it will do purging and refilling the purging is done by the instrument to remove any air bubble into the ligand solution so here we have to ensure that while refilling there should there should not be any gap between the plunger of this syringe and our ligand solution because that gap may introduce air bubbles later so here now we can see there is no gap between that white plunger and our ligand solution so the the ligand is now so the ligand is now loaded into the syringe and now what we have to do we have to bring it to the rest position we have to remove the fill port adapter and then we have to keep it back and then we we have to put this syringe into the cell and formally now we can start our experiment we can set set the parameters and all and start the experiment for and for that we need the control need to move to the control software now after the syringe when the syringe is formally seated into the cell we will again come to the software and we will click next and now the this the loading is completely done now it, it, this page will come where we have to set the parameters for our experiment the first parameter is syringe uh, concentration uh, syringe molar concentration so which is uh, 60 micromolar so we will put 60 micromolar here and the next is the cell concentration which is 1 micromolar which we will put 1 uh, micromolar here and the other parameters we can set by clicking here the temperature 25 degree centigrade it is fine reference power for protein ligand insertion we are using 6 microwatts uh, stirring speed 750 and initial delay is the delay bet between uh, the equilibration and the first injection this is 180 seconds and now the number of injections which i am setting to 25 now after setting the injections this table will come where we can set the volume of each injection first injection should be very small so i am putting it 0.4 micro liters and after that the uh, other consequent injection i am putting as 1.5 micro liters and then i will click apply to rest then all the injection will be, all the other injection will be of 1.5 micro liters now here we have to uh, 
keep in mind that the total volume of all this injection should not exceed 40 microliter because the volume of ligand loaded into the syringe is 40 microliter by default. So after setting these parameters, we can click on the start to start this experiment. Before starting, it will ask to save the experiment. So we can save it as ITC demo. Now it has started. Uh, the temperature is already out at 25. So it has moved to the third step. Here we can see the steps which will be followed during the experiments. Uh, set uh, idle, then setting the temperature, and then equilibrating. Equilibrating means it will bring up the reference power to 6 microwatt as set by us. After the equilibrating is done, it will start after it will start giving the injections. The first injection will start after 180 seconds in the initial delay of after equilibrating. And after that, the consequent injections will follow till 25 injections are completed. After 25 injections are completed, it will show uh, this ready, it will become blue and our experiment will be done. So after the experiment is done, we will move to the analysis software of our experiment. So now we will analyze our experiment using the analysis software. First we will open our experiment. Uh, we can search it, it by the name we put that is ITC demo. So it is this one. So here it is this one ITC demo. Okay. So here we can see uh, we uh, we can see the with consequent injection the differential power is decreasing and finally it is reaching. To a, around zero and is, it's constant in last few injections and here we can see the instrument is showing binding that means it is there is a binding between the li ligand and our protein so uh, we, after running an experiment it is important to run a control experiment which is ran in the same way but in the cell only buffer is used and no protein is there so we have to add that control experiment to this uh, experiment while analyzing. So I have already uh, run that control experiment. So I will add that experiment here. Uh, so it is this one ITC demo control experiment. So uh, this experiment is now added and it is already written here control. Why? Because while saving this experiment, we need to add underscore CTRL after the experiment name, then it will, it will automatically take it as a control experiment. Now we can see we are, now we can assign controls here where we can uh, subtract the control from our experiment. Here we can see it is showing titrant to the titrated with buffer. Uh, this is the file name and the method of uh, control subtraction here it is we have three methods mean point to point and line here we have selected line so now we will go to the uh, adjust fit and here we will try to fit this this data to get a good sigmoidal uh, curve so I will, it's a simplex fit, we can see now it is nicely fitted, all the points are uh, closer to this line, so it is nicely fitted and now we can move to the presentation part and go to the this final figure. This will give us the final uh, data for our experiment. Here we can subtract the, here we can see the baseline is continuously going down. So we can subtract the baseline to bring it to normal. And then we, here we can click show results, which will give us the values like uh, N, N is the number of sites, and then KD value, which is here 1.35 micromolar. 
then delta h which is minus 335 kg per mole and other values can be found here. So now this is the final figure which we can export it from here in our required format. Suppose we are doing here in the PJ format and we can, we can save it as ITC demo and now it is saved and our experiment is completed. Now what are the different advantage of the ITC? Okay, uh, it's it is a very it's, uh, you know sensitive method, so it actually can be able to help you in terms of you know determining the all the thermodynamics uh, parameters. So it actually can give you the stoichiometry, it can actually be able to give you the association constant or dissociation constant. It actually can give you the binding enthalpy in a single experiment, and most important is there is no need of labeling. That is. Uh, chromophore is not required or fluorophore is not required. So without the help of the chromophore and fluorophore, you can be able to uh, determine whether the ligand is binding to the enzyme or not. Then it actually gives you the direct determination of the binding enthalpy. So there is no indirect measurements. There are no, uh, you know, so it actually gives you the direct uh, me measurement of the binding enthalpy and say whether the binding is exothermic or endothermic. Uh, interaction occurs in solutions, so it actually mimics the biological system. So it mimics the biological environment because most of the biological reaction occur in an aqueous environment or actually occurs in a solution. So it actually can mimic that. Then uh, the possibility of performing the experiment with optically dense solution or, or unusual system like the dispersion, intact organelles or the cell is also possible. So you can actually not only going to, you, you cannot not only use the enzyme, you can actually be able to use like the cells or virus for example. So you can actually use the virus particle as long as the system is uh, you know, homogeneous or it is actually remains sus in suspension, you can be able to use that. So you can actually be able to use even the full cell, like for example, you can use the yeah. RBC, you can use the macrophages and you can say whether this uh, particular molecule is binding to macrophage or RBC or something or not, right. And you can easily calculate some of the drug molecules, whether they are binding to virus or not, right. So what you can do is, uh, you, in the reaction vessel, what you can do is you just take the virus particles and first you are actually going to do a background correction because as soon as you will take the larger molecules, as soon as you will take the organisms, for example, the organism will have many types of proteins. It's not going to have only one protein, right? So it's not a pure system. It is actually an impure system where you are going to have the, for example, in the virus, you are going to have the coat proteins, you are going to have the river transcriptase, you are going to have DNA, RNA and all that kind. So background is going to be very high and that could be one of the challenge what you have to face. So then what you can do, do is you can actually be able to inject the compound. And as soon as you will inject the compound and if the virus is binding to this particular in, uh, compound, it will actually going to show you a dip. Okay, and this dip will actually going to be keep re reducing and ultimately you are going to see a saturation. And that's how you can be able to calculate whether the compound is binding to the virus or not. You will not be able to answer whether the compound is binding to which protein or which molecule because that is very difficult to say. But and other thing what you also can do is you can, for example, if I want to know whether the uh, virus is infecting the epithelial cell or not, right? So if I want to do this kind of experiment, here are the both the virus and as well as epithelial cells are containing the some amount of, uh, you know, many proteins, right? And that's why there will be a problem of background because when you add a virus, right, there will be a heat exchange within the virus, right? So within the virus, there will be heat exchange. And then within the epithelial cell, there will be a heat exchange. And there will be a heat exchange when they are interacting as well. So you want to know this, you don't want this, right? So this has to be subtracted, this has to be subtracted and then you are actually going to see a subtracted data. And then from subtracted data, you can actually be able to make out 
when the you are adding the virus whether there will be a significant change in heat exchange or not so this is little more complicated and little more difficult to perform uh, it is very fast so you can be able to do a binding study within one hour or two hours depending on how frequently or how much time it requires for the substrate to interact with the uh, enzyme molecules or not. What is the disadvantage? So there are several disadvantages. Uh, heat is a universal signal and each process contribute to the global measure heat, thus complicating the evaluation of the contribution because of the binding. So this is I have already explained with the help of uh, a reaction a, a example like virus and epithelial cells right so you, you are only measuring the heat right you are not saying that heat whether the heat exchange is from the virus particle or whether from the epithelial cell or whether from the their interactions so it you cannot distinguish from this h this h and this h right the only way you can actually be able to distinguish is that if you subtract this one and this one from the original data but uh, sometimes that may not be also uh, accurate and that may be also misleading. So heat is not only the parameter which actually changes when the ligands are interacting with the enzyme and that is why it is not very uh, you know it is actually going to be uh, misleading sometime okay because if there are complicated system like this uh, it may actually result into the change in heat but that may be because of the uh, internal heat exchanges within the system itself. Uh, the large amount of sample is required because you have to fill the reaction vessel with the enzyme, you require a large amount of ligand and so on. Low throughout cannot be suitable for HTS. So this kind of measurements cannot be done for multiple ligands. So because for LV ligand you are supposed to prepare the enzyme for the reaction vessel and so on. So it's, it cannot be done on a HTS mode actually. Kinetically slow process and may be overlooked. So sometimes if you are actually having the enzyme substrate interactions and this, but the kinetics is very low, right? So it requires actually one hour, for example, or it requires 10 minutes, for example, to bind the complex and then now it's only going to form the complex, right? So these kind of reactions are actually going to be a problematic. Uh, a limited range is consistently measuring the binding affinity. So it's actually also, um, you know, a limited range is consistently being measured and binding affinities. So uh, what we have discussed so far, we have discussed about the uh, isothermal titration calorimetry and how you can be able to use that for measuring the uh, enzyme substrate interactions and how you can be able to calculate the different types of binding constant and the different types of thermodynamical parameters. So uh, with this I would like to conclude my lecture here. In the subsequent lecture we are going to discuss some more techniques related to enzyme substrate interactions. Thank you. Mm -hmm.